Chapter 54, first part of Don Quixote from Cervantes that treats about the Morisco record. Which deals with matters relating to this history and no other. The Duke and Duchess resolved that the challenge Don Quixote had, for the reason already mentioned, given their vassal, should be proceeded with. And as the young man was in Flanders, whither he had fled to escape having Don Rodriguez for a mother-in-law, they arranged to substitute for him a Gascon Lacqui, named the Silos. First of all carefully instructing him in all he had to do. Two days later the Duke told Don Quixote that in four days from that time his opponent would present himself on the field of battle armed as a knight, and would maintain that the damsel leaked by half a beard, nay a whole beard if she affirmed that he had given her a promise of marriage. Don Quixote was greatly pleased at the news, and promised himself to do wonders in the lists, and reckoned it rare good fortune that an opportunity should have offered for letting his noble host see what the might of his strong arm was capable of. And so in high spirits and satisfaction he awaited the expiration of the four days, which measured by his impatience, seemed spinning themselves out into four hundred ages. Let us leave them to pass as we do other things, and go and bear Sanko company, as mounted on Dapple, half glad, half sad, he paced along on his road to join his master, in whose society he was happier than in being governor of all the islands in the world. Well then, it so happened that before he had gone a great way from the island of his government, and whether it was island, city, town, or village that he governed he never troubled himself to inquire. He saw coming along the road he was traveling six pilgrims with staves, foreigners of that sort that beg for arms singing, who as they drew near arranged themselves in a line and lifting up their voices all together began to sing in their own language something that Sanko could not with the exception of one word which sounded plainly arms, from which he gathered that it was arms they asked for in their song, and being as Side Hammett says, remarkably charitable, he took out of his alforias the half loaf and half cheese he had been provided with, and gave them to them, explaining to them by signs that he had nothing else to give them. They received them very gladly, but exclaimed, Geld! Geld! I don't understand what you want of me, good people, said Sanko. On this one of them took a purse out of his bosom and showed it to Sanko, by which he comprehended they were asking for money, and putting his thumb to his throat and spreading his hand upwards he gave them to understand that he had not the sign of a coin about him, and urging Dapple forward he broke through them. But as he was passing, one of them who had been examining him very closely rushed towards him, and flinging his arms round him exclaimed in a loud voice and good Spanish, God bless me! What's this I see? Is it possible that I hold in my arms my dear friend, my good neighbor Sanku Panza? But there's no doubt about it, for I'm not asleep, nor am I drunk just now. Sanko was surprised to hear himself called by his name and find himself embraced by a foreign pilgrim, and after regarding him steadily without speaking he was still unable to recognize him. But the pilgrim perceiving his perplexity, cried, What? And is it possible, Sanko Panza, that thou dost not know thy neighbor Ricot, the Morisco shopkeeper of thy village? Sanko upon this looking at him more carefully began to recall his features, and at last recognized him perfectly, and without getting off the ass threw his arms round his neck saying, Who the devil could have known thee, Ricot? In this mama's dress thou art in. Tell me, who has Frenchified thee, and how dost thou dare to return to Spain? where if they catch thee and recognize thee it will go hard enough with thee. If thou dost not betray me, Sanko, said the pilgrim, I am safe, for in this dress no one will recognize me. But let us turn aside out of the road into that grove there where my comrades are going to eat and rest, and thou shalt eat with them there, for they are very good fellows. I'll have time enough to tell thee then all that has happened me since I left our village in obedience to his majesty's edict that threatened such severities against the unfortunate people of my nation, as thou hast heard. Sanko complied, and Ricot having spoken to the other pilgrims they withdrew to the grove they saw, turning a considerable distance out of the road. They threw down their staves, 
took off their pilgrims' cloaks and remained in their underclothing. They were all good-looking young fellows, except Tricot, who was a man somewhat advanced in years. They carried out forges all of them, and all apparently well filled, at least with things provocative of thirst, such as would summon it from two leagues off. They stretched themselves on the ground, and making a tablecloth of the grass they spread upon it bread, salt, knives, walnut, scraps of cheese, and well-picked ham bones which if they were past gnawing were not past sucking. They also put down a black dainty called, they say, caviar, and made of the eggs of fish, a great thirst wakener. Nor was there any lack of olives, dry, it is true, and without any seasoning, but for all that toothsome and pleasant. But what made the best show in the field of the banquet was half a dozen bottles of wine, for each of them produced his own from his alforges. Even the good Ricotte, who from a Morisco had transformed himself into a German or Dutchman, took out his, which in size might have vied with the five others. They then began to eat with very great relish and very leisurely, making the most of each morsel very small ones of everything they took up on the point of the knife, and then all at the same moment raised their arms and bottles aloft, the mouths placed in their mouths, and all eyes fixed on heaven just as if they were taking aim at it. And in this attitude they remained ever so long, wagging their heads from side to side as if in acknowledgement of the pleasure they were enjoying while they decanted the bowels of the bottles into their own stomachs.